Isaiah chapter 65. Um, so here Isaiah is um, yeah, speaking to people that are suffering, a people uh, that are a nation that is in exile. So Isaiah chapter 65, we'll start in verse uh, 17. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will, it, will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered a curse. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them, or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The dust and dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain, says the Lord. And uh, we'll flip to uh, Revelation uh, 21. Uh, at the end of the, the Bible, uh, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from the Lord, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, (coughs) for all the things has passed away. There we go. Give me a thumbs up for the sound guys. All right. Well, hey, look, why don't we spend some time praying as we do uh, open up God's Word this morning and, uh, and we do have a look at the, this great picture of hope uh, at the end of the Bible. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for your Word. We thank you, Lord, that it does not shy away from the suffering and the pain of our world. But, Lord, it enters into it. In fact, you entered into it. And, Lord, you explain and show us the hope that we can have even in the midst of that suffering and pain. And, Lord, we do pray that uh, you'll help us to understand your word and might we indeed be able to live out of the hope in which we have in Christ. Amen. All right, well, hey, church, we are getting towards the end of our series on rest, and it has been a a really great series uh, this year. Uh, But, uh, hey, I want to give you one quick heads up, and that is uh, next week we're actually going to have a question and answer session. So if you have any questions from this whole series at all, I would love you just to come and uh, uh, dump those onto our Slido. Now, that link is up there on our website. If you look under the podcast and sermon section, I mean, even if you're thinking about a question now, chuck it in there before you forget. Uh, there's actually tons of really, really good questions in there already, which you'll see uh, on that link. Uh, that'll be something to, uh, yeah, that, that we'll be wrestling out next week. All right, well, we're going to be talking about uh, rest for the weary uh, this morning. Uh, We'll be talking about that passage, uh, the great passage there in Revelation particularly. We're going to be focusing on that. Uh, But hey, look, uh, you know, let's uh, uh, let's just take that moment to actually remember the hope that is there in the Bible. The Bible doesn't shy away from the hard stuff. Uh, In fact, I think it's a good thing that even this morning, having we been able to enter into the space, into the reality, the messiness of life, the brokenness of our world. You know, 
I've been just reflecting recently about Hollywood in particular uh, and how uh, Hollywood, you know, we love Hollywood. We love the big movies. Uh, uh, you know, the one I saw recently was intense. It was, you know, the question of who's going to survive, who's going to not. Uh, but you know what's going to happen at the end, don't you? You know, the music plays and the heroes walk down the tarmac victorious and, uh, and you can kind of sit back and rest. But life isn't like that, is it? No, life is messy. Life is full of suffering. Life has a reality about it. In fact, partly I think actually what Hollywood is offering us is the escape from life, isn't it? It's the escape from the traumas and the difficulties and sufferings of our world, the things that we all do go through together. But let me ask you about the ending of the story of the world. How does that end? Mm. You see, away from Hollywood, do you have any concept of even just what does happen at the end of time? See, if you're an optimist, maybe you believe that actually, well, the world, the world will end one day, but we're slowly and surely heading in a, in a direction of progress. And one day we will reach a point of utopia where everyone gets along, our differences are tolerated and uh, all wars and political violence are over. Maybe you're more of a pessimist and the world for you is heading towards a dystopic future of violence and oppression and of powerful governments or corporations ruling with tyranny and oppressing anyone in their way. Maybe you're neither. Maybe you believe that actually whatever happens one day, the sun goes supernova and it wipes us all out the end. Now, whatever you believe about the future affects the way that you live in the present. Do you live in hope? Do you live in despair? Do you live in apathy or meaninglessness? Now, these are big questions, and I'm glad you're here, especially if you're thinking, well, actually, I'm not quite sure I know the answer to that. Now, I say this is the last talk in our Rest with the Weary series, and uh, it's been a lot of fun, and we've been on this journey, really, actually, I don't know if you've noticed, but actually been tracing the story of the Bible. Well, this is the way that the Bible accounts of all history from beginning to end and everything that happens in between. And we've been following through through this theme of rest from the way that it starts in the Garden of Eden. Man, God, there, at rest in the Garden, everything's perfect. Everyone's satisfied through to the disaster of the fall as we're kicked out of the garden to do life in toil and trouble. Life would be hard, there would be no rest, and one day we would all return to dust. But God doesn't leave us there. He sends his one and only son into the world who restores our relationship with him. He brings rest for the weary. No longer left in our own, forsaken by God. No, he carries our burdens down and he gives us the promise of rest for all those who would follow him. But if you're sitting here today, you probably know that your life does not look like a life of perfect rest. In fact, you know that you're not at your happy ending. Maybe you've done all that you can. Everything that we've talked about and suggested about rest, about physical rest, spiritual rest, emotional rest. You've done all the things. You want to set some good habits, spend time with God. And yes, in one sense, in the most deep and satisfying and fulfilling sense, we can know rest in Christ, and yet what we look around in our world and we know that there is not rest and peace in our world. In fact, next term, we're actually going to look at the story of Job. It's the story of a righteous man who loved God. He loved his family. He just loved life. And yet he suffers a series of unconscionable events in his life and how he and his friends wrestle with what that means. You see, the Bible doesn't promise that total and ultimate rest comes now. Because we live in a broken world. We live in a world of chronic or terminal illness. See, maybe you really uh, identified with what uh, Anne and Anton were able to share about uh, the mental health and the anguish that comes from that. Maybe it's relational breakdown. Maybe uh, it's the, the, the stress of international events of not knowing what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, I think that's why actually it is easier for us to escape. It's easier for us to flick on the Netflix and just tune it all out, drown it out in a series of Hollywood stories. 
But there is a story I want to suggest to you this morning that you can escape to that does promise real rest. That isn't just a fantasy. That isn't just a Hollywood story. And so we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 21 today because it's the second last chapter of the Bible and it really gives us the ending of the story as it is according to the Bible. And it's the reason why we can, well, we can actually know that the best is yet to come. Now, Revelation is a book written by John. Uh, John, as he sits on the island of Patmos, uh, he's not there to have a holiday. I mean, it kind of looks like quite a lovely place there, actually. Uh, but he's not there. In fact, actually, back in the Roman uh, em- Empire, the island of Patmos was one of the islands in which they sent criminals to, right? This was more like Alcatraz than Honolulu. And so there he is, John, as he's writing. He's writing uh, these uh, out of a a place of being in exile, in uh, in prison. He's writing to a church that's undergoing unbelievable persecution. See, uh, in the early church, right, 70 AD, what happens? A massive fire breaks out in Rome, destroys a huge portion of the city. What does Emperor Nero do? In fact, he blames this little Jewish sect known as the Christians. And so that was the time, you ever heard of the the whole thing of being thrown to the lions? This is the period in which Christians are routinely treated like nothing, thrown to wild beasts for the pleasure of the crowds. A few years later, uh, Emperor, uh, Emperor Dominician takes it up another level. This is the world that John writes to. This is the church that he writes to. But as he's sitting there on the island of Patmos, God gives him a vision, a vision for how it all ends. And it's a vision of hope. So if you read with me in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Now that little phrase there, new heavens and new earth, you saw it there both in Isaiah and in Revelation 21. Uh, And we're going to look at Isaiah 65 in a little bit more detail later. But we'll see what John is describing is actually, is actually what he's saying is that there's going to be a total new creation. New heavens, new earth, and there's going to be no sea. Now I'll explain what that sea was, but jump with me down to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now you see there, you can see the comparison, is it? The first chapter of the Bible and the second last chapter of the Bible. You see where, how it's all wrapping up together? The new creation, the new heavens, the new earth. And if you're wondering what the sea is, well, uh, under the the, the way that the ancients viewed the universe, uh, now this is their cosmology, right? This is not a statement about uh, about their scientific understanding of the world. It's more like the way that things relate to each other. And the sea was this thing of chaos, right? This thing of chaos in which God holds out in creation. He brings out order out of the chaos of the waters, You think about the flood and the way that water comes in and and it crashes and creates chaos in the story of Noah. In fact, I don't really need to tell you this because you live in the city of Brisbane and you know what floods do to this city. But you see that there's a picture in which the new creation, there'll be no sea for the thing of chaos will have been banished forever. It will be gone. And all the world and all its brokenness and its suffering will have passed away. And the new heavens and the new earth will come and take its place. Now, I just want to make something clear about that eternity. It's not that we're going to spend our lives now and into eternity, kind of just floating on the clouds, just jumping from cloud to cloud. Uh, No, no, this is a, a real physical place, right? It's a new heavens and a new earth. Now, actually, I kind of love that fact that uh, in the perfect world, you'd be able to eat and drink and, and enjoy each other's company without the burdens of sin. Yeah, so all those things that you enjoy now, you'll be able to enjoy more without the constraints of the brokenness and suffering of our world. You'll be able to travel and explore and eat and drink 
and be able to spend time with your friends and your family and all sorts of things. Have hobbies, play games, music, sport, catching up with people, past and present. Don't know about you, but it sounds pretty sweet. Kind of like that. It's a new earth, a perfected earth. You see, part of this series has been about uh, learning how to live out of our rest, knowing that that is our future together. Right? It's not that we're trying to bring heaven down to earth now, because actually the promise was for something in the future. No, no, what our rest is about now is actually beginning to anticipate what is to come. You see, I've been on this journey through this series where I've been actually trying to get back into some hobbies again, right? Right? See, one of my goals for this is to, to go back and actually start doing some of those things that, that, are, that really kind of delight me, that I enjoy. See, in some way, actually, that is a picture of heaven. Now, I know that it's limited now. In fact, uh, probably like lots of you, uh, you know, you might have had lots of hobbies when you were young and single and, and maybe you're a teenager or a young adult, but then you take on full-time work. Or you take on marriage and family and then, and then suddenly all those hobbies and kind of things like, like time for yourself, like that's, that becomes like something of a, of, a, of a pipe dream. Now, to an extent, actually, that's a good thing because you've got to grow up, you've got to take on responsibilities, you've got to live less for yourself and more for the sake of others. But, but part of what it actually means to be human and to one, to, to one to, to who's got a hopeful future is to be able to start living out some of that now. And so I've been getting back into the NRL. I haven't watched that for a few seasons and enjoying uh, uh, cheering on the Broncos and uh, been getting into uh, my barbecues, which I know some of the guys were able to come over and enjoy yesterday. Uh, but, but what I'm looking forward to ultimately, I'm not trying to find my peace now and my rest now, but I'm anticipating the great moment of eternity in which I'll be able to enjoy the new heavens and the new earth, how good that will be. So, creation is not just the new creation, it's not just hopping around on clouds. But what's surprising then is actually the next verse, which gives us a little bit more detail. Verse 2. Read with me, verse 2. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Right? New creation. But the city comes out of heaven, comes down to be in the new creation. Now, you've got to ask yourself, why Jerusalem? Uh, why not Brisbane or Sydney or New York or Paris or somewhere else? Well, the answer is it's not that Jerusalem is, is in a particularly special kind of place or anything like that. Uh, that's actually because there's a particular building in Jerusalem that is important. It's not an Eiffel Tower and an Opera House. No, no. Jerusalem was the home of the temple, the home of the temple. See, the significance of the new Jerusalem is the idea that the temple, the place where God dwells, would come from heaven and to be on earth. Right? So the high point in Israel's history is that they built the temple and God comes to dwell in it. And what's being promised here in the future is that actually the heavens and the earth are going to come and be as one and God will come and dwell and be with his people. You see, when God is with you, when God dwells with you, peace abounds. When God is far from you, then there's danger and unrest. Now, the problem is that uh, in Jerusalem, Jerusalem actually got destroyed twice. Uh, once by the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar, 587 BC, the temple got destroyed. And then they rebuilt the temple. Then 70 AD, as part of that persecution of the early church, the temple got destroyed again. And so as John writes this, he knows that Jerusalem itself is in need of creation. This city that meant to symbolize God with his people was destroyed, is going to be restored. So you come down quickly with me to verse 22 to, to kind of read a little bit more detail about what this city is going to be like. Come with me. John writes, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple." The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the, lamp is its, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On, uh, on no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. 
The glory and honour of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Right, this is the perfected city. This is the city that will draw the nations into it. Even the kings and queens will bring their splendour into it. You won't need to shut the gates because there will be no night time, no danger in this city. There will be nothing threatening or shameful in it. Now, look, I've actually been uh, really fortunate in my life to have visited some of the great cities on earth, uh, London's, Paris, Rome's, you know, whatever else you want to throw out there in that, uh, in that level. Lived in Sydney for a number of years. But let me tell you what I know about cities. Now, cities are wonderful places. They're full of people from all over the world. And the great cities are, are like this melting pot of cultures and food and ideas and lots of good stuff. But you know what else cities have? You know what else cities have? They have a lot of crime, poverty, debauchery, immorality. They are dirty places as much as they are glorious and splendorous places. You've got to lock your door at night. You've got to be careful where you're walking around the city. Why? Well, I think cities kind of do that. They magnify both the great things and the worst parts of humanity. That's what cities do. But not this city. This new Jerusalem will be the ultimate city. right? More charm than Paris, more beautiful than Sydney, more culture than New York, safer than Singapore. That was the best I could come up with Singapore. Sorry, I know, I know, I know. Singapore's a great place. It's clean and it's, it's safe though. It's very safe, right? Am I right? Yeah. So tell me, do you not want to go to that city? Do you want to live in that city? In fact, John describes it as being like a bride comes straight from heaven. You know, I've actually kind of had the, uh, the privilege again of, of actually uh, being the guy who gets to stand down the end of the aisle, both you know, as a groom, but also as a celebrant a few times. And, uh, and there's the, the great moment at the start of a wedding where the bride just appears at the end of the aisle, right? And everyone gasps and it's this, this perfect moment because there she is in all of her glory for everyone to see. And here is Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem coming down like the glorious city that it is. This beautiful moment. And it comes and it comes to dwell and be the symbol now. In fact, no longer a symbol, the reality. Why? Because the Lamb now lives. God and the Lamb, they come and live in the middle of this city and their glory is so bright that the light shines constantly. You come down, verse 3 now. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. This is the great promise. This is perhaps, maybe it's the great theme even of the Old Testament. It's the promise of God dwelling with his people. And Israel had it. They had it for a short period of time and then they lost it. In fact, if you trace some of these, you want to look up some of these verses, you can see these exact words keep coming up again and again and again all the way through the Bible. And when Jesus comes and steps onto our planet, and when he comes and he dwells with us, what is he called? He's called Emmanuel, God with us. You see, when God is with you, everything's going to be just fine. That's the God of comfort, the God of power, the God who comes and is able to banish evil. See, sinners melt in the presence of God. But when God comes to you and he dwells with you, you are no longer an outsider. You are part of his family. You're part of in, and you have the best dad that you can possibly have. And then what does this dad do? He says... He will end pain, suffering, and death forever. Verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Now I mentioned earlier that John's really echoing what was said there in Isaiah 65. So let's have a quick look at Isaiah 65 now. Verse 17. C. I will create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. 
I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more in it. <coughs> Never again will there be an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. And the one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. Do you see this picture? This picture of what Isaiah promises and which John affirms? Friends, death is evil. Death is evil. There's no feeling on earth like the death of someone close to you, is there? I'm sorry to kind of add to some more sob stories this morning, but I will just mention one thing. I'm not much for crying myself, but there was a moment in my life in which I mourned, I was sobbing uncontrollably, and that was at the, the funeral of our daughter, Brianna. See, our second child was born with organs that wouldn't support life outside of the womb, and so as she died shortly after birth. And I'll never forget the feeling of lowering her tiny body into the ground and burying her. You know, even today, our kids, who were too young to quite understand, they still have their moments where they ask us around the dinner table, where would, where would Brianna have sat? Where would she have sat? And you know, that, that crying and mourning for us is not something that we will ever live down. But it does remind us that death is the ultimate evil, the thing that deprives us of the joy and the experiences that we could have had with our daughter. Now, about a year and a bit ago, uh, a friend of ours, uh, someone we know, she was taking her friends down to Dreamworld for a, a day out together. Uh, at the last minute, she actually decided to invite her mum along to join them. There were three generations together. You know, it was sort of one of those perfect days down at the amusement park. You take the photos and you remember it back. Her mother dropped them all home. You know, everyone tired and happy. She took her kids inside. And they barely kind of opened their front door when they heard this horrifying screech of tyres and the crushing of metal. What had happened is a drunk driver, four times over the limit, was travelling at 150 kilometres an hour, swerved onto the wrong side of the road, hit her mum, killed her instantly. In fact, it was just a few hundred metres down the road from their house. She and her kids had to watch her die, the paramedics, the white sheet getting pulled over the body. In fact, because it was so close to that home, the pain persists. Why? They drive past that spot every single day. You know, church, you only have to live long enough before you experience someone close to you die. And we've heard stories this morning of the struggles of life. Uh, some of you know the Honebergs uh, and Xavier, who died just 15 years of age this week. Some of you have experienced miscarriage, the death of friends, relatives this year. Church, death is a month old. It is, isn't it? But the hope and the joy of this passage, of God's promise for us, is that death will not have the last say. Revelation 21, verse 6. 21, verse 6. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Friends, for those in Jesus, for those who come to drink of the living water, friends, he will give life. He will give an entrance into that city, the eternal city. You know, friends, if you're here today and you've not partaken of that water, let me urge you to do that. To do that today. Friends, who knows what will happen? You could walk out of here and get totaled by a drunk driver, a truck, anything. And if you're not sure about it, come along to our Christianity Explored our course starting soon. You see, church, this is why we as a church want to be a church that reaches others with this message. This is the life-saving message. This is the message. This is the reason why we want to take the gospel to the tens of thousands of people who live around us who don't have this hope. 
This is why we want to fill this, this building multiple times over and have multiple, multiple congregations. Why? Because there, every person who comes in and gets to know Christ will know life, life eternal, hope beyond death. That's why we're in the business of making devoted disciples of Jesus for God's glory. Because we know how the story ends. Around the land. Surrounded by disciples from every nation on earth. Giving praise to the one who shed his blood for us. We are to be a people of hope. People who are looking to the future. A people who look forward to that day. Who know that this is not our home. Who know that death will not have the last say. See, friends, the hope of the new creation is a reason that we can truly say that the best is yet to come. Now, I said at the start that actually how you think about your future affects the way that, it, that you live in the present. Affects the way you live in the present. Now, I'm going to give you three ways quickly as we wrap up to show how actually this changes everything. This shapes everything. This shapes everything now. So, number one, hope gives you the anchor without which... Life could dishearten you. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, for a lot of us, actually, life is going to be just a little bit more disappointing than we'd hoped. There's tedium, there's monotony, there's suffering, there's apathy, there's boredom. There's going to be the drudgery of life, of doing the little daily tasks. There's going to be the fact that maybe maybe some of the things you dreamed about didn't come to pass. Maybe for you it's singleness. Maybe for you it's unemployment. Maybe it's not getting the dream career that you wanted or the life that you'd hoped for. Well, friends, if what the Bible is saying is true, then there is something that you can cling on to. And that is the hope of the new heavens and the new earth. That gives purpose, that gives meaning to the things we do now. Even the little things, when you change your baby's nappy for the 16th time today. But there is a hope and a a purpose beyond that. Maybe you're actually down the other end of the spectrum. Maybe you actually, well, life's actually pretty, kind of pretty good right now. Kind of pretty good right now. Number two, hope gives you the anchor without which the pleasures of this world might seduce you. You see what I mean? Like maybe life's so good now and so relaxing, so comfortable that actually you're likely to be drawn away into something that you know may destroy you. See, maybe it's just all the, the, the accumulation of little things, the wasting of time on you know, the little mini dopamine hits that we might get from our social media or TV gaming, whatever it is, to the big addictions or, or the pursuit of money or sex. They're the kinds of things that could destroy you. In fact, one of the things that are proven to determine the success in your life is your ability to delay gratification. That is one of life's ultimate skills, to put off what's going to be most uh, enjoyable for me now so I can seek the thing that is bigger and greater and more important. Well, the hope of the new creation gives us the anchor, gives us a thing to work for, to look forward to, to to, to not settle for the, the many pleasures and the things now that might drive us and actually take us away from God. So, number three, finally, hope gives the the anchor without which suffering could crush you. This is kind of where we've been at all today, haven't we? And I don't know what you're going through right now. Maybe for you, you could identify with some of the things that the Triana shared. Maybe it's your depression, your anxiety. Maybe it's your trauma of the past, the physical pain, relational breakdown. Maybe it's a thing of shame, your addiction, your sin that weighs you down. Friends, the new creation gives you a hope, an anchor from which you can cling to. And as that moment comes, you'll be able to cast that thing off. That means that even the pain, suffering or shame that you have now might grow, you might push you towards that ultimate, that new heavens and that new earth. There's a, a lovely lady, her name's Joni Erickson. Uh, she's a, actually a reasonably well-known author in America. Uh, she was a really active 17-year-old, like really athletic, sporty kind of person. Uh, she was out with some friends and uh, she, she, she went diving into this lake. 
Now, little did she know that there was actually a sandbank there. So the lake, which is normally several metres deep, was actually only about 50 centimetres deep. She dove straight in there, broke her neck, instant quadriplegic. In her book, she writes about what that experience was. The anger, the depression, the suicidal thoughts, all of those things that you can imagine, that your life, which just as it was peaking, it was looking up, gets uh, cruelly just cut off in that way. But, you know, she went on to author books. She went on to, to host a radio show that actually uh, gave hope to, to millions of people. She particularly is really active in the, in the space for others who are, who are handicapped or disabled. In fact, she actually reflects on this and she says she no longer regrets the accident. She no longer regrets the accident. This is what she says why. She says this. I hope in some way I can take my wheelchair to heaven. With my new glorified body, I will stand up on resurrected legs and I will be next to the Lord Jesus. And I will feel those nail prints in his hands and I will say, thank you, Jesus. He will know I mean it because he will recognize me from the inner sanctum of sharing in the fellowship of his sufferings. He will see that I was one who identified with him in the sharing of his sufferings, so my gratitude will not be hollow. Then I will say... Lord Jesus, do you see that wheelchair over there? Well, you were right. When you put me in it, it was a lot of trouble. But the weaker I was in that thing, the harder I leaned on you. And the harder I leaned on you, the stronger I discovered you to be. I do not think I would ever have known the glory of your grace were it not for the weakness of that wheelchair. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for that. But now, if you like, you can send that thing off to hell. I love the way she ends that, isn't it? That wheelchair for her was a thing of intense pain, disappointment, depression. But also the thing that led her into the arms of a strong Lord Jesus who carried her. In fact, she says, I'm not sure I would have even known the glory of what it would mean to, 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 to look forward to that new resurrected body if it weren't for that. So church, replace that wheelchair for whatever it is for you that you're going through. Your shame, your depression, your anxiety, your trauma, your pain, your physical pain, whatever it is. And know that if that drives you into the arms of the Lord Jesus, you'll be able to enter those gates of the new city, the new Jerusalem, and cast that off forever. And that is the glorious hope that we have the rest that we will have with Christ forever. Let's pray. Father God, it's been a hard morning, Lord, as we sit and we reflect on the sufferings and the pain, the brokenness of our world. And as we've heard this morning in so many different ways, Lord, it is a real thing in so many of our lives. But Father, we praise you too, even in the midst of that. Because in that, you entered into it. Lord, that you broke the curse of sin and death. That you rose victorious over it. And Lord, you are leading us to the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, in which we'll be at a rest. Rest in your arms. That we'll be at a rest knowing that sin and shame and sickness and death will have been done away with. Father, for those of us who are struggling right now, will you help us to cling tightly to that anchor, that we would cling tightly to Jesus, that we would seek him out, that we would learn to grow through our struggles, that we might learn, Father, that actually Jesus, and only Jesus, offers us that rest that will sustain us to eternity. And we pray all of these things in his name. Amen.